gentle light that falls around me, you're the first thought on my mind, and there are voices rise, all creation cries, singing out of the endless hallelujah from this moment on, join with heaven's song. I want you to have joy tonight in Jesus. I want you to realize that at the end of your rope, at the end of everything that you think will give you joy, at the end of everything you think will fill you, at the end of every drink that you're taking from the world right now, every single bit of that, at the end of that, when all that gets nailed to the cross, 
when all of that gets buried in the baptism of these waters and you rise with him, you will have joy. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. How great. clap those hands church you might as well go ahead and lift your voice how great is our God come on say it how great is our God 
until the whole world sees how great, how great. Come on, stand to your feet if you're able to. Sing it with me. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. Is our God. The healer, deliverer, savior. Until all see. How great is our God. Come on, lift your voice. Lift your hands. Worship him for just a moment. How great are you, Lord? Great are you, Lord. Come on, sing. How great. Let your hands magnify the Lord. Let your hands say how great is our God. All you are at home, clap those hands. All you people, shout unto God, unto God with a voice of triumph. He's worthy, great, magnificent, glorious are you, Lord. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Woo! Welcome to week 299. Wow, how great is he? Woo! If you can pull yourself together for just a moment, greet your neighbors around you, love on somebody there in your area. We just want to take a moment and greet you there at home, at work, overseas, wherever you're tuning in from. Last Sunday, I was watching from Honduras. So all over the world, people are watching and tuning in tonight. We thank God for you. The Spirit of the Lord is going to move right there in your home, right there in your home. Right there in the hospital room, if you'll allow him and invite him in, the Spirit of the Lord will meet with you. Jesus will walk into your room, quicken your mortal body right there where you are. If you'll invite him in, if you'll call out to him tonight as we call out here in Dawsonville, Georgia, if you'll call out right there where you are, I promise you he will meet you. and He'll meet your need. Amen. Are you glad to be at the North Georgia Revival tonight? We are so honored to have you on behalf of our church, our staff, our elders. Thank you for joining us on week 299. You don't want to miss next week. Elbow your neighbor and say, you better be here next week. It's week 300. 300, y'all. Big things are going to happen next week, but big things are happening tonight for sure. We just want to take a moment and say thank God for Sid Roth. They're in Charlotte, the ISN Network. You've been faithful. You've been with us. You've helped get this message all over the world. We're very grateful for the relationship we have with you. We bless all of you there in Charlotte and all the affiliate stations. May the Lord pour out his spirit upon you. Amen. If you have your Bibles, go with me to Mark chapter 6 tonight. Mark chapter 6. We always honor the Lord by the reading of his word. We always want to make prayer and the reading of the word the most important things. His presence and his power, his authority. His glory. The worship's good. The message will be great. But man, His presence. There's nothing that compares, right? Amen. Mark chapter 6. We'll jump down to verse 45. If you got your Bible, hold it way up in the air for just a moment. Whether it's printed form or digital form. Look at the room just lit up with all the phones. Wow, look at that. Look at the technology. And don't be, a, don't be, don't be offended that we have a digital version. Because your King James was once a scroll, so... Remember that. Mark 6, 45, before I get in trouble. <laughs> we love you, Lord. Mark 6, 45. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude away. When he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to worship, to sing, to preach, to prophesy. 
What did he do? If Jesus himself went to pray, I think it's important that you and I do the same. Verse 47, now when evening had came, the boat was in the middle of the sea and he was alone on the land. Then he saw them straining, the disciples, he saw them straining at rowing for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. You see that? Came walking on the sea, but he would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost. They cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, be of good cheer. It is I, do not be afraid. Then he went up in the boat with them and the wind ceased and they were greatly amazed. The wind ceased. The moment he went into the boat, the wind ceased. One version says the wind was so exhausted with itself, it stopped. That pressure you've been feeling, that breath that you've been feeling on you, that thing that's been eating at you and chasing at you and pressuring you, that thing that's been frustrating you, Jesus tonight desires to frustrate that thing until it gets so sick of causing you sickness, that disease gets so irritated within itself, it ceases to hinder you anymore. Many of you tonight will meet Jesus for the very first time. Many of you will meet Jesus in the water and your sickness and your disease will cease immediately. He said, be of good cheer. Don't be afraid. Do you know, do you know that is the most commanded phrase in the entire scriptures? Don't be afraid. Don't fear. 365 times at least, one for every day of the year for you. Don't fear. I know the world is shaking and our world, the world's in darkness and chaos, and, but don't forget, that's where the Spirit of God begins to hover. Genesis 1, in the darkness, he was hovering. He's hovering over you tonight. Can we just lift our hands? Can we put our phones down, put our Bibles down, and in this moment of worship, just make your place a sacred spot for you to meet with Jesus? Would you just pray this prayer? Say, Lord Jesus... I didn't come to watch tonight. I came to seek you. I came to chase after you. Lord, I'm not checking out the revival. I'm not checking anything out. I'm crying out. Move in this place. Move in the people, Lord. Move those, move in the homes that are watching right now. Move in those families. Move in their bodies, Lord. Let sickness and disease flee. Flee. Every demon trembles right now at the mention of your name. Jesus. Come on, say it. Jesus. Invite him in power. Jesus. Move in this place. We worship you tonight. Amen. Amen. place to hide this weary soul, this bag of bones. And I tried with all my mind, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, oh, a vagabond. And just when Change my name forever free. 
search the heavens high If I search the earth below If I make my bed in hell No matter where I go Where can I run from his spirit? Where can I go from his presence? Even in the deepest depths No matter where I go If I search the heavens high If I search the earth below If I make my bed in hell No matter where I go Where can I run from his spirit? Show us your glory, let every burning heart 
from the depths of your soul for others for that is why I came I came for you when you are there does my word say that I will not provide everything you pray for for someone else for you so when you pray yield yourself surrender yourself to me was not a song just about my worthy son, my servant, my beloved Daniel. What did he do? He prayed for his nation from the depths of his soul for 21 days straight. And then I sent my high priest, Michael, to remove anyone who stands in his way. And my messenger was sent and his his prayer was heard. So when you come to the Father, come empty. Come for your brothers and sisters. And your prayers will be answered as the Father answered every one of my prayers. I am interceding on your behalf at the right hand. I have his ear. And when he hears me, he hears you. Come to me in prayer. Empty yourself. Intercessory prayer is for everyone, says the Lord Most High. Show us your glory, show us your glory, in wonder and surrender we fall down. Show us your glory, show us your glory. Let every burning heart be holy ground. Show us your glory, show us your glory. In wonder and surrender we fall down. 
Show us your glory. Show us your glory. Let every burning heart be holy ground. Oh, we won't relent until you come, Lord. There is a king seated among us. Let every heart receive him now. Where there is praise, he will inhabit. There will be grace and mercy all around. And every burden will be lifted in His presence. Every trophy will be laid down at His feet. There is a name that reigns above all others. Jesus Christ, the King above all to the Lamb, honor and glory, worthy is He who overcame, buried in shame, risen in power, He is alive.
Come on, lift your voices all across the room tonight. Come on, lift your voices. Lift your hands all across the room right now. Such a dominating presence of the Lord in this room. Bless the Lord. He is in this house. young and old. Let's sing it to the Lord. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. Oh, see how great how great is our God. I want the ladies to sing on just the ladies sing that just the ladies How great come on women of God One more time, ladies. Come on. Come on, Debras. Come on, Esthers. How great is our God. Come on, sing it like sing you're waiting on your bridegroom. How great is our God. And all see how great, how great is our God. Come on, man. This is your time. Come on. Come on, men of God. Rise up, O oh men of God. Sing it. Where are the Davids? Come on. One more time, men. Let's go. Right here. Way down deep. Do it. Here we go, all together. All together. Come on. Well, let's let them hear it down the road at Moonshine Festival right here. Come on. There's a new fire water.
God, this gathering of believers, we know one thing. We know that you are great and you are greatly to be praised. For there is none like you that has ever been or ever will be. For you, O Lord, are supreme. You're preeminent. We bless your God. We bless the Lord. We bless the Lord. God, we bless you. And everybody in this house said yes and amen. Come on, let's put your hands together. Magnify him. Come on, magnify him with your shout. Magnify him with your clap. Yes. Wow, the sick presence of the Lord is in this room. I want you to love on one another as you make your way back to your, to your chairs, if you will, please. Love on one another. Shake each other's hand. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Jesus. So good to have you in the house. We want to welcome the ISN network on week number 299. Donald, I'm really hot up here. Just turn, turn this down up here. Thank you. Praise God. Who's here from out of state tonight? Would you raise your hand if you're here from out of state? Welcome to the North Georgia Revival week 299, 299. Glad that you are here. My goodness, the fire of the Holy Spirit. I can't wait to get into the word tonight. But I do want to let you know that next Sunday, week number 300, is a very specific, special night for us. And I want to make sure that you're here. Get here early for our prayer time. And we're going to be talking about all that God has done. But on top of that, we're going to be raising $300,000, $300,000 for the North Georgia Revival's missions and ministry opportunities that we'll be planting seed in to people all over the world. How many of you are excited about that? I'll talk about that. In just a moment, can I get my, my pulpit up here, please, guys? Thank you all. Yeah, thank you, guys. And I want to um, ask if Lorraine Barge, are you here, Lorraine? Come here for a second, if you would, please. Welcome her as she comes to the platform. Thank you so much. I know you come up here quite often. And uh, we love to tell your story, but tonight's very special. Five years ago today, I had a clean PET scan, and it's continued to stay clean. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Right there behind us. Those were 50 metastasized lesions of cancer. Yes, spread on all my bones. The doctors, usually when they write up a report, they'll measure it and say what bone. They just said extensive, spine, hips. I mean, they just listed the body part. Yeah, I can see it in your liver. I can see it in your kidneys, um, your lymph nodes, everywhere, all over the place. It was pretty desperate. Yes. You know what? We, we found something that I think that may interest you. You guys can be seated. Take a look at this. Is it Come on, lift your hands. Go to war for her. Go to war for her. Those watching my live stream, stand up. Begin to worship for her. Begin to sing songs of healing over her. Sing songs of deliverance over her. That Jesus, the great physician, would step into her life in this moment and heal from the inside out. Jesus, you hold her world in your hands. We believe you, Lord.
right there at that moment that God came and touched you. You go the next day to get a PET scan on October 29th, 2018. And um, what were you thinking when you went into the doctor for your, uh, your scan? Well, I knew before I came that the Lord had healed me, but it just hadn't manifested on my body yet. The Lord dropped that revelation that he's my healer from my head into my spirit during those past few months. And I know it was a praying church. I know it was people praying for me. I mean, it just dropped from my head to my spirit. So I knew the healing was done and I knew he told me to come here. And I knew when I got out of the water that I couldn't turn my head. When I got out, I could turn my head. So I knew you couldn't turn your head before. I mean, I could turn it, but it was painful. It was painful to turn my head. When we were driving up here, I tried to turn my head and look at my husband and it was painful. And when I got out of the water, we were sitting back there praying for people. And I just turned my head and I was like, wow, that didn't hurt. And this was just a few minutes after getting baptized. So you get the PET scan on Thursday. I think they emailed you. You got it on uh, Monday or Tuesday. And then you go home and you get the email. Right. I actually went to the doctors on Thursday and I had the re- got the results. The doctor, um, I don't think knew the Lord. And he just said, um, 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 this is not typical. You know, sometimes we see it just, you know, a little part gets smaller, but this is not typical. And the PA did know the Lord. She looked at it and started crying. And she said she had seen two miracles in 20 years. And this made three. <laughs> So this is what they saw. Yes, that's what they saw. That is what they saw the day after meeting Jesus in that water. You know, I just walked in. Y'all had been fasting and praying and seeking the Lord so people like me could come in from another part of the state and walk in that water and get healed. Thank you all so much. Say that again. Thank you for paying the price. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, let's stand to our feet all across the room. Now, I met a few people from Arizona. Where's Judy? Where are you, Judy, in, in the room? Come here, Judy. Can you make your way quickly here? Uh, they flew in from uh, Phoenix area. You what? You drove. You drove. Wow. Okay. That's pretty intense. So you drove. How long did it take you and, and your I don't friend? know. Three days we went to to Tulsa, to ORU. We went to Nashville and recorded a CD, and here we are. <laughs> but we had to be here. We had to come. How long have you been watching the North Georgia Revival? When COVID hit, I had gotten really sick, and so I was afraid to go to my church. I go to Fresh Start. It's very large, and so I, I stayed home, and I don't know how I found you, but about a year ago or more, I started watching North Georgia, and it's just amazing. I don't think you realize how much you're reaching people. Here I am sitting in my bed in Arizona watching Pastor Todd's amazing sermons, and I order washcloths. Would you like those testimonies? (laughs) About a month ago, I had a friend who was near death. He was in the hospital. He wasn't eating anymore. He had um, cancer came back. Um, I told his wife about North Georgia Revival and the power in the water and the washcloths. And she said, well, okay, these are non-believers. So she comes to my house early in the morning and I had the washcloths and she said, I'll take two. And I'm like, okay. So 
She took the two and she went to the hospital in ICU and she laid the washcloth on his chest and on his stomach. By this time, he wasn't able to walk. He wasn't eating. Um, How long was he in that condition? Do you know? He was in the hospital. It was over oh, three or four weeks by the time the washcloths got there. Um, but he was really bad the last, that week before. He wasn't eating. So that was getting really serious. So the next day, she said, oh, he's sitting up and he ate a meal. And then the next day, he was able to sit on the side of the bed and get in a chair. And then the next day, he started walking. And he's home now, and he's doing 100% better. My Lord. It's your prayers. You, you, I don't think you realize. My friend had a dog in upstate New York. The dog had a terrible tumor on his eye. She said, I think I'll get a washcloth. So she orders a washcloth. She puts the washcloth on the tumor on the dog's eye because it was blocking his vision. And she prayed for him. And so a few days later, she's up in her prayer room and she's praying and the dog jumps up on the bed with her. And she looks and the tumor totally disappeared. The doctor said they couldn't remove it. It was too dangerous. All right. In context, um, y'all know the, um, the breaking of the water video that we showed um, had a half a million views in like just a week of y'all having the pool party, Holy Ghost crossing over. And, uh, and so now, um, dogs and animals our recipient of what the Lord is doing <laughs> in <laughs> I know I know I know what some of y'all are watching and lurking around are going to do with that um, but I don't care I don't care come here so so that she laid the washcloth on the dog's eye you were saying something about it was inoperable. It was, and they, were, they couldn't remove it because they were, it would bleed a lot and it would cause a lot of problems and make it worse, and he could lose his vision. His name is Tyson. And it was just off, and everything was fine, and he can see perfectly fine. So the tumor just literally... <laughs> fell off. <laughs> Stay right there, Judy. We're excited to get baptized tonight. We know God has more miracles, and we're just believing. Thank you. Come on, Judy. Help her. Wow. Well, if you got a sick animal, how many of you love your animals? Come on, really. I mean, how many of y'all know that our animals comfort us when, all right, and, um, and we love them? They don't have a soul. They don't, you know, they're not, but they're precious. And the Bible even talks about taking care of your animal. Okay. It's a measure of a man by how well he treats his animals. That's what the word says. So, um, I don't know about you. I think there ought to be a run on washcloths tonight. It would almost be negligent to leave this place tonight. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word, the testimony, okay, the spirit of prophecy, that testimony, the Hebrew means care and he will do it again. He'll do it again. He'll do it again. He'll do it again. I don't know who told me yesterday they had one frozen in their, um, um, in their refrigerator. Who said that? Someone told me, was it? Christy, was it you? Do you have them in your, you got them frozen in your, you got them just on standby. I know you got, yeah, just got them on standby, Dave. You got them on standby. I mean, grab you three or four, put them on standby. You never know. Your neighbor comes by that's unsaved. You sick? Well, I got, listen, I'm telling you, 
Acts 19 is your reference. He took handkerchiefs from the Apostle Paul's body, laid it on the sick, and they recovered. I know it's weird to the world and weird to people that don't understand what we have seen. I get it, okay? It's weird to people that, that have not seen what we've seen. But when you... Come here, Karen. Um, our, our puppy, which is not ours, but Ty's, her name's... I've got two beagles called Crimson and Tide. Everybody say Crimson Tide. All right. For those of you that don't know football, that's Alabama. Well, anyway, well, Crimmy got sick really bad, really bad, where she could not move her neck. She could hardly even walk. And I think Ty, you want to tell this right quick? Yeah, we got home from church one night and they were with us. The, the dogs were with us. I guess we were keeping them or whatever. Ty was out of town. I don't know. But anyway, they would greet us. And so Crimson walked over and she looked kind of spry, you know. So I reached down to pet her and she was wet. And it hadn't rained or anything. So I'm thinking, how did she get wet? How is she wet? And so I walked over to the little the puppy bed and Ty had put a towel on Crimson's body, and she laid on it long enough to heal her neck. <laughs> hey, it was as if she had never been sick, not at all. So if the Lord will do it for a beagle, he'll do it for you. Why not? The Bible says that the Lord did extraordinary miracles by the hands of the Apostle Paul, that even handkerchiefs were taken from his body, that people's bodies were healed and devils were cast out by simply laying a handkerchief. I don't know. We probably have a couple hundred of these tonight. Um, when you get baptized, grab one or two, put it in your pocket, hold on to it, freeze it. People come over. Hey, will you give me a couple legs? And they see a couple washcloths in your refrigerator. What are those for? Well, how much time do you have? <laughs> All right. Let's, let's receive an offering tonight. Let's stand to our feet. For those of you that are not standing yet, ushers come forward. Tonight is very significant, 299, because it's the front end of week 300. I, I really want to encourage you to give sacrificially tonight, to give boldly tonight. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Everyone a giver, you can text to give, you can Venmo, you can do whatever. If you're at home, please sow a seed. This is so important. Lord Jesus, we love you and bless you. We thank you for what you're doing in this house and what you're going to do tonight in these waters. My faith is soaring. It is in the stratosphere of what we're going to see you do tonight. And everybody in the house said amen and amen. You may be seated as you give tonight. I want to, rec I want to uh, get your attention, if you will, to the screen for just a moment. Uh, Pastor Marty, can we just move that over there for a moment? I want to show you a video of a women's conference, which is coming up in January. Now, something very specific about this women's conference is, yeah, is that uh, we have limited the seating. All right. There are only 1,300 tickets available. And when that is done, then it's over. We, we don't want to have to go to overflow rooms and so forth. So we're limiting it. And right now we are on pace for doubling. Uh, this time last year, we've already doubled the registration. So don't wait. It's going to come up on, a, on, the, on the QR code in just a moment at the end of this video. So watch this if you will, please.
Spirit of the Lord did not die with the prophet. You are not on your own. The prophet is gone, but you still have God. Were you baptized? You were baptized when you were seven. Well, I was baptized when I was seven, but guess what? I'm going to get in again. of a symbolic act. Families don't get restored because of an outward expression of an inward decision. Physical bodies don't get healed because we're doing a good Christian thing. Hallelujah. Praise God. Next Sunday, guys, do not forget week 300. Make sure that you're here. We're receiving an offering of $300,000, 300 people to bring $1,000. We're going to believe for a half a million dollars. We're going to believe for a half a million dollars. I know we set a goal of 300, but I'm here to tell you, we already have $107,000 that have come in from around the world. $107,000 already come in. Now, if we just have our 300, that's already 400. And then the rest of us bring whatever the Lord lays upon your heart. I'm telling you, we're going to support Ukraine. We're going after India. We're going after Honduras. We're going around the parts of the world. We're, we're ministering here in America, all over the place. Those monies will be sent to missions, mission agencies, and missionaries all over the world. Are you glad to be here tonight? All right. If you've not registered to be baptized, make sure that you do that tonight. And uh, you can go and register at the conclusion of our service as Bishop closes us out. It's my honor to have Bishop Lance Johnson in the house today. Would you stand to your feet? Help me welcome the lead pastor of Relevate Church, Bishop Lance Johnson. Right around 8 to 8. Come on, let's give the Lord some praise in the house tonight. He's worthy, church. Come on, you can do better than that. Come on, I believe you got a radical praise left in you tonight. Come on, I know you're grateful for where he's brought you from. I know you're thankful today that he reached way down and found you where nobody else would find you. Come on, he's worthy. He's been the healer of your marriage. Come on, your way maker where you thought there was no way. Come on, your refuge, your strength, your strong power. He's worthy tonight, church. Glory to God. Excited to be back with you tonight. I'm always honored. It's such a refreshing night when I get to come to the North Georgia Revival. I want to just take a moment before I jump into the Word. If you want to be turning your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 16 tonight, I want to just take a moment and say at week 299, I'm excited uh, to be here for all 299 weeks on and off. It's been an honor to be a part of this revival uh, from its beginning. And, and what I want to do tonight is just give tonight honor to Christ's fellowship, to the people that labor so much every single week. 299 weeks of committed, devoted prayer that is relentless people that have stayed up till five or six in the morning baptizing, people that have labored and vacuumed the floors. I've been in here at the end of meetings when they lasted so long that the cleanup crew was vacuuming the floors and we're still praying for people. Guys, it takes a lot of labor and a lot of love and a lot of honor to God to host 299 weeks of global revival. And I just want to honor Christ Fellowship tonight and the faithful people that have labored in the presence of the Lord, not because they had to, but because they wanted to honor the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Would you take just a moment and help me to honor all the faithful people that have made this revival possible? Let's let them know we thank them tonight. We appreciate their labor of love. Come on, thank you for every extra hour you prayed. Thank you for vacuuming. Thank you for washing the scrubs. Thank you for working so diligently. Thank you for staying till the wee hours of the morning.
morning in the waters as people are being healed. Thank you. I appreciate all the people that, that make this revival possible. Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 19. Tonight, I normally don't title messages, and I'm not really preaching a sermon as much as I'm just delivering a word the Lord gave me the other night in my hotel room, and he just dropped this in my spirit. I'm going to deliver a few, uh, I'm going to deliver a few points that the Lord showed me because I believe there are people in this room tonight that desperately need Jesus. How many of you know that there can be people that desperately need the Lord, they just don't know it? I'm going to say that again. There can be people that desperately need Jesus. They, don't, they just don't know it. And I'm going to pray that tonight God is going to open eyes all over this building and that people are going to see their need for him tonight. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. And there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, everybody say, and in hell he lifted up his eyes. Being in torment, he sees Abraham afar off. And Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember thou that in thy lifetime thou receiveth thy good things. And likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to, to you cannot, and neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they come to this place of torment. And Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they might repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Father, I thank you for the revelation of your word. God, I thank you for the anointing, God, upon all of our hearts and our ears that we may spiritually hear what you would speak to your people tonight, God. Thank you for the anointing on the frailty of this clay flesh that I may speak the word, Father, in a way, God, that will absolute penetrate the heart of every person in this room that you would have your will and have your way. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want to bring your attention to five things that Lazarus had while he was here on this earth, excuse me, that the rich man had while he was here on this earth. Number one, I want to bring out that he had wealth for himself to the point that it made other people desirous of what he had. Now that's not a bad thing, but I'm, I'll bring out my point in just a moment. He had resources, he had goods, he had stuff, he had a home, he fared sumptuously every day. And there's nothing wrong with being rich. The, the Bible doesn't tell us that, that money is the root of all evil, but it does tell us that the love of it is the root of all evil. But you know, sometimes we can get so busy with all of the things Things that we're blessed with, that we're so busy making money, we're so busy trying to manage our money, and sometimes we're so busy spending our money or enjoying our money, we don't really have vision of what's going on around us, that maybe we're so preoccupied with what we have that we don't see what is really needful that is around us. So I want you to see tonight that he had wealth. Let me, let me bring 
bring you also to Revelations, if I might, tonight, chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. There was another generation of people called the Laodiceans. They were believers. They were devout followers of Jesus. At one time, they had been in revival, and they were on fire and accomplished many great things in behalf of the Lord. But the Bible says that Jesus writes to them in verse 16, and he said, I wish you were either hot or cold, but you are lukewarm. And the reason that they were lukewarm was described in the following verses when the Bible says that they, the Bible said, because thou sayest I'm rich, I'm increased with goods and I have need of nothing. In other words, he looked much like this rich man. They had need of nothing. And he says to them, knowest that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. It's a possibility that we can think we have everything when in the eyes of God we don't have anything. I need to say that again. It is possible for you to think that you have everything you need, even to the point that people desire what you have. But in the eyes of God, really, you don't have anything. And the scripture goes on, and I, I, want to, I want to bring that to attention. The next thing that it says is that all of his needs were basically met because he fared sumptuously. There was no needs in his life. He didn't feel the need for anything. He felt comfortable in the place that he was. But because of that, there were some other attributes that he had in his life. He had no concerns for those that were around him that were less fortunate. I need to say that because every day while he was busy doing whatever he did, he walked by a beggar that laid at his own gate every day. A man that laid basically at his front door. When he would go into his house, he would have to walk by a man who was begging, not for his wealth, not for his fortune, but simply for a crumb that would fall from his table. Anybody with me? Is it possible that we can become so satisfied and so fulfilled and so caught up in what we have that we don't even actually see the needs of those that are begging around us? Is it possible we could go to work every day and walk right by the drug addict that's begging for deliverance? That we could walk right by the broken hearted woman who's trying to raise her children and her husband's having an affair and she don't know how to deal with life and out of her brokenness she's weeping and crying out for help but because we're so busy managing all of the blessings that we walk right by them every day. That we walk by the people that are hurting and the people that are broken. Not only did, did, did he not have, now watch this, not only did he have a, a, a in this life uh, so much that he did not see a need for the less fortunate, but he seen no need to show any mercy while he was in this life. There was no need for him to have mercy. How I many of you know there's some people that just feel like they're okay? Because they live a pretty good life. They live well. They do good. They're better than the dope addict. They're better than the guy who's selling her, or the woman selling her body on the corner. Anybody in here with me? Well, I'm better than so-and-so because at least I'm not a sipping saint. Uh-oh. Can I just really be real tonight? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm better than they are. You know, I hadn't slept with that many people. Well, I'm better than that. At least I'm delivered from Marlboro's. I don't cuss like they cuss. There's a lot of people that just really don't think they need mercy in this life. They think I'm a good person. I pay my bills. I pay my dues. I do what's necessary. I take care of my family. Look at my children. Look at my wife. Look at our boat. Look at our house. Look at our cars. We're good people. We got the things we need in life. I work hard every day. I tell the truth. I'm honest. And they really don't think they need mercy. And in this life, he's seen no need for mercy in his life. Not only did he see that he didn't need mercy, but he did not think that Lazarus laying at his gate needed mercy as well. And the next thing I want you to notice, and I'm almost done with this, is the fact that he had no ability in this life to see the hurts and the wounds of those that were around him. 
Because not only was Lazarus hungry and was he a beggar, but the Bible said his body was full of sores. He was full of brokenness. And the Bible said that the dogs came and licked his wounds. Isn't it amazing that we can walk by people every day and not see their wounds, but yet the dogs. And in the scripture, the dogs represented the unsaved world. It represented those that were not in a covenant. Can I tell you, for every broken and wounded person that's in the world right now, for every homosexual, struggling right now because they were molested most of their life. The dogs came and licked their sores when the church turned their nose up at them. I want to preach in here today because we were so we were so annoyed by their sin we, we didn't hear the backstory of what put them in the condition they're in. We're so busy pointing our finger at the needle in their arm. We didn't know that they got molested when they were three years old and that their, their mama's boyfriend raped them repeatedly up until they were 16 years old. And then we wonder why they put a needle in their arm trying to find some kind of self-medication for the brokenness and the pain that they're living in. My God, it's easy to point your finger at that woman that's sleeping with everybody, but you don't know the backstory of how her husband cheated on her repeatedly and walked out on her and left her to raise her children on her own. She was rejected by her father, and then we wonder why she finds comfort in the first man that shows her attention. Oh, I need to preach in here tonight. Because see, we walk by the bleeding and the wounded and we walk by the hurting every day, never understanding why they're bleeding. But let me tell you something, the dope dealers are licking their wounds. The world is licking their wounds. But the problem is the attention they're giving them is bringing infection to their brokenness. My God, the attention that they're giving them is not helping them. It's only killing them. Let me give you an analogy of what I'm talking about tonight. You got a man that's going through a separation with his wife. And he's struggling and he don't know what to do because his marriage is in conflict. And maybe he's not been the best husband. But maybe she's not been the best wife. And they're battling and they're struggling in their marriage. And along comes the dog called the co-worker. Come on, Bobby, let's go to the club tonight. Come on, let's go down here. Man, you deserve a night out tonight. Let's go down here and drink some Jack Daniels and shoot some shots. And let's go down here and do a little coke. And while we're at it, we'll find another woman to ease the pain. Somebody say the dogs will lick the wounds. While we've been judging with our long noses and our long fingers pointing, the world's been licking their wounds. I need to preach in here tonight. I, I need you to understand that, 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 that the rich man never saw the wounds on the man. He never saw a need to call a doctor, to find a minister, to somebody to heal him. And because he didn't see it, the Bible said the dogs licked the wounds. And the Bible said eventually Lazarus died and he was taken by the angels. To Abraham's bosom. Now, I don't know about you, but I believe that if he's in Abraham's bosom, and we may call it the holding realm of the dead, but I'm going to tell you, I believe he looked up there and saw him in heaven. I believe he looked up and saw him in paradise. He saw him in the realm of God for the first time. Anybody with me today? You see, I believe in Abraham's bosom. I don't believe Abraham's in hell. I don't believe he's rotten in a grave somewhere. I believe he was in the bosom of Abraham. And by the way, if you believe that Abraham's bosom is some other place besides heaven, I wonder how he swapped grave sites. Just a thought. Just a thought if you're still laying in the grave after you're dead. How do you swap grave sites? Hello, somebody. That means he's living after he's dead. I need to preach it here tonight. I said he's living after he's dead. I need you to understand one thing in this room tonight. I don't care where you're lost or saved. You are going to live after you die. You're going to live in one or two places. And this scripture tells you, you're either going to one place. You're either going where Abraham's at or either you're going to a flame where there's torment. 
And it doesn't matter how much preachers don't preach about it. I promise you, hell is just as real as heaven. And the Bible says that, that, that the rich man went to the grave. Everybody say to the grave. And then the Bible said, and in hell. Everybody say in hell. I don't know about you, but it didn't say that they took uh, the, uh, Lazarus to the grave. It said they took him to Abraham's bosom. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to the day I take my last breath because I know one thing. I sure ain't going to the grave. I know there's something that awaits me greater than some dirt on top of the casket, somebody. I know to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I just wonder if there's some believers in the room that understand that I've got eternal life. I've got everlasting. I, I, got, I got life. My God, I'm living for that place. I don't know about you. This is not my life. This is not my world. I don't belong to this place. I belong to a heavenly kingdom, somebody. This world ain't nothing but my pilgrim. I'm a pilgrimage. I'm here today, but I may be gone tomorrow. My God, where's a church that lives for eternity? Where is a church that believes in the heaven they preach about? Where is a church that is in a betwixt between the two like Paul was? Whether to stay here with you or to go be with him. Boy, it got quiet on me today. Because the truth is most of us in this room ain't living for eternity. We're living for this world. The truth is we're doing the opposite of what God said. We love the world. I'm going to say it again. We love the world. We love the things in the world. We love our life more than we love the thoughts of eternity. Can I tell you there needs to be a church that got so close to Jesus that we'd rather be with him than we had to be here. Well, that's just hyper-preaching, man. Well, the apostle Paul said he was living in that realm. What's wrong with creatures that have set the example of how we ought to live? But the Bible said he was in hell. Everybody say in hell. Yeah. See, because between this life and hell, something changed. For the first time in this man's life, somebody say he looked up. Say it again, he looked up. And when he looked up, everything changed. Can I tell you, everything changes when your vision changes. See, that's the problem. The Bible said in John chapter 3, verse 3, the Bible said a man must be born again. And if you're not born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Let me say it. You cannot see the kingdom of God. What does that mean? It means you can't perceive it. You can't understand it. It don't make sense to you. That's why we got so many people in the church today that don't understand the kingdom of God because they've repeated prayers. They've gone through the ceremony, but they don't understand the will and the purpose of God because they went through a ceremony without being born again. And unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom of God. Can I preach in here tonight? Let me tell you what that means. That means if they had to drag you to church and make you want to worship God and make you want to hear the word of God, it probably means you're lost. It, it probably means you don't know him because if you knew him, wouldn't nobody have to beg you to be here? Oh, I said if you knew him, nobody had to make you read your Bible. Nobody had to beg you to pray because when you get born again, you desire the things of God. You see the kingdom. God, we're trying to pastor people that ain't born again. We're, we're trying to pastor people that repeated a prayer and took a bath, but they've never had their spiritual eyes open. And because we wanted your offerings and we wanted you to fill our pews, we didn't say nothing. Because we were living for our vision instead of living for the king. So the vision became more important than the king and therefore your salvation did not mean what it should. Can I make a statement to you tonight? It's possible for you to love your prophecies more than you love the God of the prophecy. The problem is we worship our prophecies 
instead of the God of the prophecy. See, when you love the God of your prophecy, you don't have to chase your prophecy because you know the God that gave it to you has the integrity and the power and the authority and the, and the, and the uh, character to bring your prophecy to pass without you having to chase it and violate every biblical principle to have it. And because we are vision chasers, prophecy chasers, we filled our pews with people that they don't have the heart of Jesus. If I'm full of the Holy Ghost, then I'm full of the heart of Jesus. If I'm full of the Holy Ghost, I'm full of the desires of God. I need to preach it here tonight. If I'm, full of the, if I'm full of the Holy Ghost, I'm full of the love of God, that I love what God loves. For God so loved the world. I'm going to say it again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, can I preach in here today? Because if I love God, then I'm going to love sinners. If I love God, I'm going to love the lost. If I love God, then I'm going to be, uh uh-oh, I'm going to be like the good Samaritan. I'm not going to be like the priest. Are y'all hearing me? I'm not going to walk by the guy laying in the ditch that's crippled and go around him because I don't want to deal with his nastiness. I'm going to be the good Samaritan and I'm going to stop and get the man out of the ditch that's wounded and bleeding and I'm going to pour in the oil and the wine. My God, I need to preach. Because see, when you're born again, you can't walk by broken people. It becomes your business. You can't walk by the hungry. It becomes your business. It bothers you to ignore the needs that are around you. Wow. Somebody say being in hell. It was an eye-opening experience for him. I'm not preaching mean, church, but I'm telling you, I'm preaching to wake people up. I'm on an assignment from the king, and it's to get people in the church saved. It's to pull you out of the blinders of religion that said, I'm good, Bishop, all's well. I'm fine. I don't need anything. I'm wealthy. I have everything I need. If you got so much Use what you got to heal other people. If you got so much Pentecostal power, there's some crippled people that need to be healed. If you got all you need, then I know some demon possessed people that need your excess of power. I know some folks in this room tonight battling with cancer. If you got so much, how about give us some? Well, we're good, Bishop. We got all we need. I'm here at revival. I'm good. I don't need to show up six nights a week to pray, Pastor Todd. We're good. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. And you don't even know who's sitting three chairs down from you. You didn't know that there are people sitting in this room right now that walk through these doors thinking, God, if you don't show up in my life tonight, I'm going to walk out these doors and blow my head off. There are people sitting in this room that said, if God doesn't heal me tonight, I've got nothing else left to live for. That there are people right now days away from dying from terminal diseases that have come through these doors and they're hopeless believing God that he's going to meet them in the water tonight. But that's none of your business because you're good. I'm good, Bishop. I, I just come for a good sermon. I wanted to get blessed tonight. And the Bible said being in hell. Everybody say being in hell. It's amazing how our surroundings can change our perspective. 
But the problem is it doesn't matter how much you change in hell, it won't do you any good. Because if you wait till you get to hell before you get your eyes open. But see, the problem is in hell, he saw what he should have seen in this earth. Because in hell, notice what the first thing that he saw. He got a revelation of heaven. And he looked up seeing Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. Somebody say he got a revelation of heaven. See, when you get a revelation of heaven, you, start, you stop living for the right now. And you start living for eternity. See, right now, you're not worried about eternity. You're not worried about salvation because you're just trying to make it another day. But when you get a revelation of eternity, then you understand, I have to make a decision right now about my eternity. That what I've got going on presently in my life is going to have to take a back seat for me to take care of my eternal destination. Come on, the church has got to get a revelation of heaven again. we got to get a revelation of eternity. We're so busy preaching about the God of right now that we forgot to warn people about a literal heaven and a literal hell. Wow. Woo. We're not preaching like somebody's life may end tonight. Y'all didn't hear me. We're not preaching To get people saved because tomorrow they could be in eternity burning in hell. We're not, we're not anxious about preaching heaven to our kids. As a matter of fact, the church don't want to hear sermons about eternity. We want to hear messages on prosperity. Uh-oh, I, I, I feel that wall. I'm going to preach right through it, honey. That's my job. I feel the kickback. Well, preacher, you're just one of them hellfire damnation preachers. I don't listen to them screaming, spitting, hellfire and damnation. My God, give me somebody that tells me about my best life right now. Give me somebody that tells me how it's going to be a tiptoe through the tulip and I can have a cuter dog and more money in the bank. Tell me somebody's going to preach positive atmosphere. Positive karma. Don't talk to me about, don't, don't kill my vibe preacher preaching about hell. Don't kill my vibe preaching about eternity because I'm loving life right now. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. The next thing that he had was he looked up. He got a revelation of heaven. And then all of a sudden, he got a revelation of mercy. He said, Abraham, have mercy on me. Somebody say, have mercy on me. See, he never saw a need for mercy in his life. And now he needs mercy in his own life. He never saw a need to give Lazarus mercy. But now he's crying out for mercy. You see, it's a different perspective when you get in hell. It's also a different perspective when you get born again. See, there was a reason Paul prayed for the church of Ephesus. That the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened. Everybody say enlightened. You see, God's got to change your, your spiritual understanding. Your spiritual eyesight. That you have a need for mercy. Everybody say mercy. See, everybody wants to show judgment, but nobody wants to show mercy. But the Bible said God's mercy is new every morning. Let me give you one more illustration. The Bible said in Revelation chapter 3, the church that said we have need of nothing. We're good. We're wealthy. We need nothing. You know what he told them to do? Go get you some eye salve and anoint your eyes because God needs to open your eyes so that you can see the thing that you need to see before you get to hell and have to have a wake up call. Woo! The third thing that he saw, and I'm about done. The third thing that he saw in hell was he said, please have Lazarus come dip his finger in the water. Somebody say in the water. Because see, the problem is while we're in this life and we're so full and drunk on this world stuff that we see no need for the living water. 
But yet Jesus' message was come and drink. You that have no money, come and drink. You that have to come and drink of the water of life freely. He said to the woman that was at the well, he said, woman, if you would ask of me, I would give you the living water. You see, she was busy trying to chase a water that wouldn't satisfy her from one man to another man until she's got five broken relationships. And the Bible said that the man she's living with was not her husband. And Jesus was trying to get her to quit drinking from a well that would not satisfy her. But in this life, she didn't have a revelation that there was a living water sitting in front of her. That if I drink that water, I don't need the dope no more. I don't need the lustful relationship. If I get a drink of that water, I can throw the water pot. My God. Somebody say living water. Where's the revelation of the living water, church? Listen, I drank from the waters of Jack Daniels. I drank from the waters of absolute vodka. I drank to the waters of white liquor. I drank from the waters of Crown Royal. I drank from the waters of Miller Lite. I drank from the, and I ain't saying the other one. I drank from the wells of the strippers. I drank from the wells of methamphetamines. I drank from the wells of cocaine and they were very deep. I need to talk to somebody in this room. I drank of the wells of wealth. I drank of of the wells of indulging in every kind of pleasureful thing that this world could offer. But I'm telling you, September the 2nd, 1990, I drank of a different well. It was not the wells of Jack Daniels. It was not the wells of this world. It was not the wells of lust and adultery and fornication. I drank of the wells, and it was not the wells of cocaine. I drank of the well that had the living water. I became a partaker of everything that Jesus Christ did. And when I drank of that well, I never went back to the old well because he who the Son sets free is free indeed I want to know if there's still a church that ain't ashamed or afraid to preach what the message of the cross really does for somebody's life We're afraid to tell people he'll really stop you from going back to them old wells. I got two more things. I'm going to finish right here. Here's probably the greatest one, and I may not get past this one. The fourth thing is, he said, Abraham, send Lazarus down to my father's house. Send me down there. I got some brothers. I got five of them. Say five. He said, please go send Lazarus to my brothers. Please go send him to my family. At least they come to this horrible place of torment. You see, right now, you'd rather teach your children to play soccer than to make sure they're actually saved. It's terrible that you got time to take them to every baseball game, but you can't sit down at the kitchen table and teach them the Word of God. It's terrible that they can quote the the backfield of the Georgia Bulldogs, but they cannot even tell you the books of the Bible. It is terrible that they know what a Louis Vuitton is, but they didn't know 
that it's their assignment according to Mark chapter 16 to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover that they shall cast out devils in my name they don't know what it said in the book of Acts chapter 2 that your sons and your daughters will prophesy my God what's wrong with this church we're not raising our babies to be saved I'm going to close with this story I was on a, a drug infested rampage. I had so lived and indulged in the world. And I'm in my home in my country club. I wasn't a I wasn't a I wasn't a, a single wide trailer in the middle of the woods with no electricity drug addict. I wasn't living in some, some abandoned building with a needle hanging out my arm. I'm sitting in a $600 recliner in a country club, higher than a Georgia pine. And I'm broken because of the wages of sin that's in my life. And I'm done with living, and Lisa and I are fighting, and we're arguing, and I'm done. And I grabbed a bottle of pills, and I said, I'm done with this thing. And I poured them pills out and I popped them in my mouth. And Lisa began to call 911. I said, if you call them, I'll kill your graveyard dead. Don't you touch that phone. My determination in my mind that day was my will was to die. Because that's what the wages of sin is. You keep living in that mess and sooner or later it's going to steal your desire to live. It's going to rob you of your family. It's going to rob you of everything that ever had value in your life. Because sin will take more than you're willing to give it. And it'll take you further down a road than you have ever want to go. You better not play with it. You better not jack with it. You better not let it in your life. Because it's coming for everything. My wife snuck in the kitchen that day and she called my brother. And you've heard my testimony before. My brother was the first person in my family that got saved. And my brother got really saved. We were like Methodist saved, Baptist saved, non-denominational saved, but we weren't born again. And I'm not saying that all Baptists are not born again or all Methodists are not born again. But I'm telling you, there's a lot of people that shook the preacher's hand and took a bath and they're on their way to hell. Because they've never been born again. And nobody in my family that I really know of was born again until my brother and his wife got radically saved. And I hated him with every fiber of who was inside of me. I hated him because every time I got around him, he told me I was going to hell. And I'd say, don't you judge me. Because the only scripture that a backslid or non-Christian knows is don't judge me, lest you be judged. If you quote that scripture regularly, it's because you're lost. It's because you don't know God. Because the people that are trying to save you, it feels like judgment to you because you know that in your heart you're not saved. And I'd shake my fist at him. I'd say, don't you judge me. I'm saved. I just snorted an eight ball of cocaine. I just put $1,000 in a stripper's garter. I'm saved. I just drank a fifth of Jack Daniel. I'm saved. Don't judge me. I'm saved. I get it. It's called being lost. When you're lost, you don't know you're lost. Not until some loud mouth spitting preacher gets right up in your grill and confronts you with truth you can't run from. Not till the Holy Ghost sets down on you and begins to deal with you and for the first time you go, maybe he's telling the truth. And I'd shake my fist at my brother. I'd threaten him, you don't talk to me about Jesus anymore. Couldn't stand to see him come into the family dinners. God, there comes them religious nuts again. They're in an occult. They got brainwashed. You ain't, it don't take all that. You ain't got to be so fanatical. 
Why you got to carry your Bible everywhere you go? Why you always got to talk about Jesus? There's other things in life. Sounds like most Christians, don't it? I have a real habit of ministering to the people everywhere I go. It's my way of life. I minister to the people that check me out. I minister to the people that serve me food. Is this okay? I like to talk to them about the Lord. I don't just accuse them of being lost. I ask them, how are they doing? What can I pray with you about today? And you know, most of them will break down and cry and say, will you pray for my mama? Will you pray for me? I'm going through this. Would you pray for my children? They're struggling in school until I get to a Christian. I asked a lady at the Cracker Barrel the other day. I said, ma'am, I'm a Christian. I'm going to pray over my food. Can I pray with you about anything? She shook her little pad at me, and she said, I'm a Christian. Look on my notebook right here. It said, I prayed this morning. I don't need your prayers. Right out of the heart of somebody who's under conviction. And in a few minutes, laying there in that recliner, my brother busts through the living room doors. And he runs in and falls down beside the recliner. And he's weeping. And he's crying. And he's saying, little brother, I love you. Little brother, you need the Lord in your life. I come to pray for you. He's crying. He said, "I, I drove over 100 miles an hour all the way up here. He said, brother, I prayed to that. I said, God, you can have my salvation if you'll just save my little brother. You can have it. I just want my little brother saved. Please save my little brother. He ran over a dog. He was driving a Nissan Maxima. He ran over a dog while he was coming. While he was coming there, he told me the story. He said the dog went up over the top of the car. He said, I was so scared. He said, I was driving so fast, I just had to get here to my little brother. Where's that kind of brokenness in the church? Where's that kind of hunger in the church that we would pray what Paul prayed? I'd be a curse from Christ for the salvation of my kinsmen. Come here, Mark. Come here. I need you to come here. I want you to see the reality of why I'm preaching the gospel tonight. Because that man that said, God, you can have my salvation if you'll save my brother. And somebody that got saved enough to love their lost family, that would love their family enough to witness to them and love them enough to lay in the altars. I'll never forget his pastor was named Brother Gann. And I'll never forget that after I got saved, I picked up the telephone and I called South Canton Church of God. I said, I want to speak to Pastor Gann. And I told him, I said, I want you to know my name's Lance Johnson. I'm Mark's little brother. He said, let me tell you something, son. He said, your brother and his wife laid in the altars of our church and they wept and cried and prayed and wept and cried and prayed over your salvation. I want you to stay on your feet. I'm done. I need you to look at me, church. We better get our eyes open before we have to get them opened up in hell. Jesus said in Matthew 7, 20, not, Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those that do the will of my father can I tell you we're so busy living this world living for the stuff living for ourselves. 
living for our own agendas, living for self-centeredness. I need you to look at me. If you're living for yourself, you are not living for Jesus. I know that some people think I preach way too hard, but I'm going to tell you, we better get some preachers that's got backbones. We better get some preachers that ain't ashamed and ain't afraid of the people sitting in their pews. Because I'm going to tell you something, I'm going to let one person go to hell on my watch if I can help it. Because there are people all over. They have no concerns about other people. They have no concerns about what God has concerns for. Some of you right now, you're like, Bishop, that's legalism. Well, there's an account in the Bible, and you can read it for yourself, where the Bible said there's going to be goats on one side and sheep on the other. And when he banished the goats to hell, the question that came out of their mouth was, basically, why? And his story was this, I was hungry and you did not feed me. I was in prison and you did not come and visit me. I was a stranger and you never took me in. I was naked and you never clothed me. And they said, when did we see you, Jesus? Well, you walk right by me on your way to church to go shout and praise the Lord. You walk right by me. I was naked and you didn't see me. You were so busy being religious and living your life for you. You walk right by him and he was begging at your gate. They were lost and you saw no need to tell them about Jesus. You saw no need to bring them to church. You just said, well, they're not going to come. I've invited them before and you just went on living life as if their eternity didn't matter anymore. I need you to hear me, church. And he said, when you did it to the least of these, when you ignore people, you're ignoring him. I didn't write that. It means what it says. And it says what it means. And it's not that we didn't see them. And you know, here's the sad part about religion sometimes. This is the sad part. To make us feel better about being too busy and too unconcerned, we throw a $10 bill at a a homeless man to feel better Oh, yeah. To feel better about our conscience. You see, God ain't just trying to get your conscience. God wants you to see the broken people around you. Because when he died for you, he died to heal you, deliver you, set you free. So that you become the vessel that he uses to set other people free. To heal them. To restore them. To see them redeemed. He sent you to be the testimony. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Being in hell, he lifted up his eyes. Tonight, all over this building, I'm asking people to lift up their eyes. If you're in this room tonight, you'd say, Bishop, I'm lost. I'm broken. I'm hurting. I'm the guy laying outside the gate and I'm bleeding. I'm bound. I got shackles all up on my life right now and I don't know how to get free. I believe that I need to be healed tonight. I'm lost and I need to be found. I'm the prodigal in the pig pen. I walked away from God and I'm lost in this pig pen and I want to come home. I know that God has something better for me than where I am. And I just want out of the mess and I just want out of the pain. I just want to come home. I want to run back home to where my father's at, but I'm afraid I've gone too far. I come to tell you, prodigal, you've not gone too far. This is your night. I come to tell every person in this room that's been blinded by religion, that's been the Laodicean church that said, I'm good preacher. I don't need nothing else. 
I'm fine. I've got everything I need. But your eyes have been blinded. I brought some eye salve tonight. I brought the answer for you to escape the bondages and the restrictions of religion that it made you comfortable in that place. I come to tell every person in this room tonight the power of God's in this house for you to be redeemed, for you to be born again, for you to come home and run to the arms of the Father. I believe that right now He's running towards you because in your heart you've done made up your mind. I'm coming home tonight. There's a sinner in this room right now wishing that I'd hurry up so you could get to this altar because you've made up your mind. I'm getting healed tonight. I'm going to get saved tonight. I'm getting delivered tonight. The demons are getting out of my life tonight. I want every man and woman in this room, I want you praying if you would with me right now. In about two seconds, I'm going to count to three. When I get to three, if you're in this room and you're backslid or you're lost, or you've been a you've been a layout of sin, you've been a you've been a lukewarm Christian, and you've been hidden in the bondages and the blindness of religion, and you're ready to come home to the Father right now. Come on, intercessors, I need you praying right now. I'm gonna count to three, and when I get to three, I want you to raise your hand. I want you to raise it as high as you can. I need you to get it in the air. I need you to raise it up, be bold, be courageous. When you ran for the devil, you ran for the dope, you ran with everything in you. My goodness, I'm asking you tonight to go after God with all your heart. Are you ready in this room? In the count of three, I want you to get those hands in the air. If you're lost tonight and you need it, and you're not going to wait till you get to hell before your eyes get open, you're ready for God to open them tonight. I want you to get those hands in the air. Are you ready right now? One, two, three. Raise them up, raise them up, raise them up. All over the building, raise them up. Every man, every woman, every person in this room, say, Bishop, I'm lost. I need him in my life. Come on, raise them high. I see him, I see him. Come on, I want every person, every person in the room, every prodigal that's walked away from God, I need you to get those hands in the air. Every prodigal that needs to come home, would you get those hands in the air? Every one of you has got your hands in the air that you raise your hands. I want you to lift up your head. I want you to look at me right now. Just those of you that raise your hands, I need you to look at me right now. I need you to look at me all over the building, every one of you. Here's what I want you to do. I'm going to count to three one more time. And I'm going to ask you to do one more thing. I'm going to ask you to come home tonight. I'm going to ask you to come home to the Father. I'm going to ask you to come to the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you to run to redemption. Run to the fountain that flows from Emmanuel's veins tonight. I'm going to ask you to run to an altar where you're going to surrender your life to God. Where a father is going to meet you and your life is going to be forever changed. You say, Bishop, why not I got to go to that altar? Here's why. Because he said, if you're ashamed of me before man, I'll be ashamed of you before my father. If we don't get it right in salvation, we'll never get it right as followers. He needs a generation that's unashamed. If we're going to start this thing, let's start it right tonight. He said, if you'll confess me before man, I'll confess you before my Father. So tonight, all over this building, at the count of three, if you're in this room and you raise your hand, I want you to get out from behind your seat, and I want you to get down here to this altar as fast as you can. If you got to run, I want you to run. If you got to walk real fast, walk real fast. But don't you let the devil keep you in that seat. Are you ready right now? One, two, three. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, all over the building. Come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, all over the building. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on. There's still others. Come on. Some of you should have raised your hand. Come on. Some of you should have done it. Come on. If they can do it, you can do it. Come on, come on. Come on. Come on, backslider. Come home. Come on, religious person, come on! Altar workers, I want you to come in. If you would, just begin to minister to them right here. We're going to pray together all over the building. Listen. Pastor, can I have can I have two 
Can I, can I? You don't have to, I understand. I need you to look at me right quick. I've never given an altar call with the heaviness that I feel in this room right now. Never. I've given thousands of altar calls and I've never given one with the burden that I have right now at the end of this altar call with this many people in an altar. There are so many people out in this room right now. I'm telling you, you're hiding. You're hiding. You're hiding behind religion. You're hiding behind a profession of faith that never brought a transformation in your life. I've been that man, so I know. I need your help tonight. How many of you in here want to see everybody in this room saved that needs to get saved? Would you agree with me? Can I have your help tonight? I need your help tonight. I want you to help me, and this is how I want you to help me. There are still people in this room that need to be in this altar. And I can't walk out of here tonight and not knowing that you could have been here and should have been here, but you didn't because I didn't do everything I could. So I want every person in this room right now, I want you to do me a favor, and I'm going to ask you with with courage and with the love of God, not with laughter, because you don't know the condition of the heart of the person next to you. I want you to turn to the person next to you when I ask you. I want you to take them by the hand, and I want you to look them right in the eye. I need you to look them in the eye. It's very important. And I need you to ask them, do you need to be in that altar? Now listen, when you ask them if they need to be here, they might just tear up. They might just shake their head, yes. And if they do, I need you to do me one more favor. I need you to take them by the hand. I need you to help them down here tonight. I need you to walk with them and be their friend tonight. Would you do that for me? Turn to the person right now next to you. Look them in the eye. Say, do you need to be in that altar? Do you need to be in that altar? Do you need to be in that altar? Here they come. Here they come. Here they come. Bring them on. Bring them on. Bring them on all over the building. Bring them on. Bring them on. They're coming. They're coming. Bring them on. Bring them on. I'm telling you, there's others. Go ahead. Just tell them, okay, I need to go. Come on, take me, take me, take me. I need to go. I need to go. Come on, come on. Come on, just be okay. Bring on, bring on. It's okay, it's okay. Just bring them on. Bring them on. Bring them on. Woo! They're still coming, church. They're still coming. They're still coming. Come on, you still need to come. There's still time. Come on, ask them again. You need to go. They're coming, Pastor Todd. They're coming. They're coming, they're coming, the harvest is coming. We're gonna pray. We're gonna pray all over this building. Listen, I can't pray this prayer for you, but I can pray it with you. I feel that, Pastor Todd. Listen, Pastor Todd's feeling what I'm feeling. Y'all feel it too, don't you? Listen, do you know what God will do? He loves you so much. He'll stop a, he'll stop a prayer to say one more time. One more time. Because it's his will that none should perish. I need your help one more time. There's somebody hiding behind the mask. And I need you to turn to him one more time. Somebody needs that encouragement right now. One more time. Pastor Todd said one more time. Turn to him and ask him one more time. Ask him to come. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. Come on. Come on. One more time. Just tell him yes. Just tell him yes. Come on. Quit fighting. Tell the devil no more. No more. No more. Pray, church. Pray. Pray. Come on. There they come. Come on. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. Come on. Come on. Just get out behind that seat and take off. Come on. Run. Run. Tell the devil I'm done. I'm done being lost. I'm done being bound. I'm done being broken. I ain't begging in the gate no more. I'm running to the hands of the master.
building, listen to me. I can't pray this prayer for you, but I can certainly pray it with you. If you'll repent, make it real tonight. Turn away from that old way of life and turn to Jesus. If you'll believe in your heart that he died for your sins, and if you'll believe that, and believe that on the third day he rose again, and if you'll confess it tonight, I'm telling you, God's going to meet you in this altar. He's going to open your eyes and everything in your life is going to change tonight. All over the building, I want you to pray with me right now. Heavenly Father, come on, tell him right now. Heavenly Father, I repent. I turn away from my old way of life. I'm done with it. And I turn to you, Jesus. I believe you died for me. And I believe that on the third day, you rose again. And tonight, I receive you, Jesus, and the blood you shed for my forgiveness. And I receive you as my Savior. And I surrender to you as Lord of my life. From this day forward, I'm going to follow you. No matter how difficult, I'm going to follow you. If I fall down, I'm getting back up. No matter if I struggle, I'm going to follow you. If people make fun of me, I'm going to follow you. If people reject me, I'm going to follow you. From this day forward, my life belongs to you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for saving me, changing my life, opening my eyes. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I want you to give God some praise in this house tonight. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. I need to tell you. I need to tell all of you something right quick. Pastor Todd's going to come. We're going to open up the waters right now. I need you to hear me right now. What God just did in your life is a miracle. Believe it. Your life is never going to be the same. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 said, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Now here's what you need to do. Listen to me carefully. You need to bury that old person. Bury him. Where do I bury him? Do I go by a graveyard plot? No. You go over there and you get in that baptistry right there and you bury that old man and that old woman until she or he is graveyard dead. That's what water baptism is. It's buried with Christ through baptism into death and raised to walk in the newness of life. Bury that old person. Here's the next thing you need to do. You need to get in a, in a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church and don't get out. There's going to be hypocrites there. There's going to be people that ain't going to do right there. But you don't go for them. You go for Him. And you stay in that church and don't you be moved. You go every time the door's open. Can I get an amen? You go get you a Bible. Come to Pastor Todd. They'll help you. Will I'll help you get you a Bible you can read and understand. If you can't read good, get it on your phone. Because there's an app called the Bible app that it'll read it to you. But you get in the Word of God and you start reading and you start growing. And every day you wake up and you follow Him. Every day you submit to Him and live for Him every single day. If you fall down, get up. But you follow Christ from this day forward. Come on, make welcome Pastor Todd as he comes. Absolutely amazing. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, for doing such a deep work. Our altar team's ready to minister to people here at the front. You can linger and stay here and receive prayer. If you're sick in your body, you can come and our altar team will pray with you. If you have letter A, if you have letter A, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to come up to my left side over here to your right. There's an opening right here. If you have letter A, gather your belongings right now. Aaron right here in the back is going to take care of you. If you have letter A, come right now, right now, right now, quickly. If you have not registered to be baptized, now's the moment that you need to move out into the lobby area. There's a table for you that you can register. 
and get in tonight, especially those of you that came to the front. Seal that decision tonight. Seal the decision tonight. Seal the decision tonight. We got all the clothes, the towels that you need. We got everything for you. You don't have to go home wet. Right now, come, letter A, right over here. Thank you, guys. Praise the Lord. Letter A, come to my left and your right. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Letter B will come up on the screen in, in a moment. How many of you ready for what God's going to do in the waters? I'm telling you, these altars are on fire. Let our altar and prayer team minister to you. Come right now if you need prayer. Our worship team is going to lead us in worship. We're going to get into the waters and watch God do miracles tonight. Life change. Next week, week 300, do not miss it. Get her early, get you a great seat. That's next Sunday, week number 300. God bless you. Let's worship God. Okay, thank you. All right, good. All right, we're good. Here we go. Testing one, two. Here we go. We should be fine. Hey, everybody, Todd and Karen back here once again, right after the service, North Georgia Revival, week number 299. What a powerful word by Bishop Lance Johnson, Karen. I'm telling you, you could feel the presence of the Lord even beginning, uh, even before the service uh, started. Uh, people were standing up, their hands raised. They're worshiping the Lord as we were doing our countdown video of last week's, uh, you know, uh, service. It was just absolutely fire in this room. I'm telling you, I you know, feel the presence of God. Every time Bishop Lance comes, he's going to go after the lost, and that's what he did tonight. And, you know, he made a great point in that oftentimes in churches today, people think that they're born again. They're not. They yeah. think that they, you know, by saying a prayer, made a commitment, but it never uh, changed their life. And, and I think that's common in churches today all over America, all over the world. And so he hit it head on, and he was truthful tonight, honest. And uh, he called for those decisions, and people came. People came. Hey, guys, speaking of, of coming, uh, I want to invite you to be here at week number 300. That's next Sunday. Next Sunday, November the 5th, uh, right here in 2023, week 300 of the North Georgia Revival Care. And it's going to be, it's going to be just glorious. I cannot wait. I think God's got something really special for us. But you guys also know that we're attempting and we were believing God for $300,000 to go to missions just right from the North Georgia Revival offering. I'm telling you, if you want to participate in that, there's multiple ways that you can do that. You can uh, Venmo the money to CF Church, just designate it missions. You can uh, send us a check, uh, 139 Hightower Parkway, Dawsonville, Georgia. Information should be coming up on the screen momentarily, but uh, and you can you can also text to give. So we're excited about that, and that's next week. Three hundred thousand dollars, Karen. I believe we're going to surpass the three hundred thousand uh, dollar 
uh, goal that we have. The number I have in my head is half a million dollars. Wouldn't it be great to raise a half a million dollars to support missions all over the world? Now more than ever, people need to hear about the truth. They need to hear about Jesus and him being the way, the truth, and the life. And so this is going to be a great opportunity for you to plant seeds. If you can't be here, there are ways to give. You can give online. And again, those will come up. But yep. be sure, if you're not with us next week, tune in and watch what God does in an atmosphere of generosity and people planting seeds. Watch and see what God does that night. Absolutely. Also, lastly, before we go back into the service, I want to remind all the ladies and pastors that are, are watching right now and have women's minister, you're trying to start one, get your ladies here to the Ignited Women's Conference in January 2024. And Karen, we limited the number of tickets. We just kept selling them and selling them and selling them last year, but we have to cut it off. And they're telling me that we are doubling the pace of registrations between this time last year and where we are today. So these tickets, once they're gone, they're gone. And, and so we're not going to open it up for overflow. We want every single person in the sanctuary. So there is a sense of urgency. Uh, also, not only getting the tickets, but getting hotel rooms, Airbnbs in the area. They fill up fast, especially that many people coming to Dawsonville. Yeah, we want to encourage you, especially if you're coming out of town, the surrounding cities. If you can't find hotel, uh, hotel reservations in Dawsonville, there is Cumming, Georgia. There's Gainesville, Georgia, and Dahlonega, Georgia. They're all about 20 to 25 minutes away from Dawsonville. But really, there's an urgency there. Be sure that you're getting your hotel rooms. Again, as you said, there's limited seating. Uh, you know, fire marshal has codes, and so we can't cram three people in the building. So you really need to get your reservations quickly. Mm -hmm. There should be a QR code up for that. There it is. I see it on the screen. So ladies, go ahead and register. Jesse Green will be with us. I'll be speaking. Amy Lyle, Pastor Amy Lyle, and Paula Jo Derricott. Pastor Marty's wife will be speaking, so it's going to be incredible. What a great, powerful weekend. So sign up, get registered today. All right, I'm ready to go back into the service, and they're going to be um, uh, praying for people. They're worshiping, and then we'll get right into the water with Pastor Marty and our teams. God bless you. Thank you for joining us on week 299 of the North Georgia Revival. If you're able to stand to your feet at this time, we want to invite you to do that. If you need to have conversation, that's quite all right. We just ask you to do that out in the foyer. Just maintain a atmosphere, prayer, intercession, praise. People are to be ministered to at the altars. We're going to open up the waters in just a moment. So many different people coming with needs, various needs. If you would stretch your hands to one of these pools. 
It is just a sign of, Lord, I'm in agreement with you moving in this place. Jesus, I'm in agreement with you getting all the glory tonight. This is not about man or ministry. This is about King Jesus being high and lifted up and him receiving the full reward of everything he paid for. If you're at home, just stretch your hand toward the TV, toward the computer. Lord, meet every need, every sick person be healed, every lost person found, every demonized person set free. For the glory of one, the Lamb of God, who sacrificed himself, bankrupted heaven, to get us to him. Lord, do it again. A week 299, do it again in Jesus' name. If you agree with that, just put your hands together. Help us welcome the first candidates into the water this evening. God bless you, sir. What is your name, sir? Scott. Scott Pinkard. Scott, where are you from? Uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. Knoxville, Tennessee. You came a long way. What brings you in the water? Well, they say I got cancer all around me. A liver, a cure. Yes. When did they discover cancer in your body? Uh, two weeks ago. But God's a healer. I'm, I know he's already working on it already. Just the time I walked in here, I can feel it. Yes, sir. Yes. Did they tell you what stage it was in or any information? Uh, it's, sta it's stage four. And, and they first told me that maybe 5% chance of making it. But not my God, <laughs> not the one I believe in. Yeah, I'm ready. Yes, Lord, thank you. You know, it's typical for doctors to, to be um, very factual about what they see. So we don't, we don't doubt that they said there's a 5% chance or it's stage four or cancer all in your body. You heard the testimony of Lorraine Barge. Jesus doesn't deny that the cancer is there. He just denies it's right to stay there. Jesus recognized the man that was blind being blind. He just said, I came so that you'd be blind no more. He saw the lame man. He knew he was lame. He said, I don't deny that you're lame. I just deny the right for paralyzation to stay in your life one more second. Who is Jesus Christ of Nazareth to you? He's my Lord, Lord and Savior. Then we have great news for you. What songs can't do, what great preaching can't do, only the King of Glory can do. In this moment, only the King of Glory can do this. There is no other way to explain what he's about to do for you. There's no other way to explain what the doctors will see. There's no other way to explain it other than the lover of my soul who paid a great price met me in a pool of water and he healed me completely did for me what medicine and chemo and radiation could not do those things help we thank God for those but at some point science runs out and Jesus runs in
Amen. Tell everybody your name. Uh, Joseph. Face this way. Joseph. Where are you from? Uh, Peachtree City, Georgia. What brings you in the water? Um, tonight, I'm, uh, I've been counseling a SRA victim, satanic ritual abuse victim, and she has struggled with, uh, because of programming, AI, all the stuff they do to her. It's over a long, long time of her life, abuse of all kinds, rituals. And the result is that she cannot uh, emotionally have any connection with Jesus. She loves Jesus. She serves Jesus. But it's like she's in a, like a robot. She cannot feel him. Nothing. So she needs that to get the rest of the healing. She needs that connection. Yeah. Who is she? She's. I don't want to give her a name because. What was your name? Diane Kern. Diane, where are you from? I'm living in Castle Hay, North Carolina. You look so familiar. But I'm from here. You're from here. Well, who's this beside you? What's your name? Debbie. Debbie. How do you know this precious lady? We went to church together. Wow. Went to church together. What brings you in the water? I have stage three ovarian cancer that I've been battling for about three years. And Debbie's been talking about this church and invited me. And I prayed about it. And I feel like God told me to come. So you accepted his invitation to come? I did. It was his invitation. She was just the messenger. She was the instrument that That's got it. it to me. That's it. <laughs> he invited you. And you came. You answered the knock. And he's here. Hey, have you ever seen a miracle? I would say that I had won my second infusion. I actually died. And um, in that moment, um, I prayed to him. And I feel like he used that moment to tell me that I wasn't alone. And I'm still here later. But I'm still battling it. And we're getting to the point where the doctors don't know what else to do. They don't know what else to do. Correct. The physicians don't know what else to do. They're good physicians. They're good physicians. Yes. They've been educated. They're good. But the Bible says there's, a, there's an adjective reserved for one physician. The Bible calls Jesus the great physician. He healed them all. 
So we have great news for you. We have great news for you. The only way you'll be able to explain it. The only way. I don't know, it was water and there were some people that helped me and a friend invited me, but it was Jesus who told me to come. It was the invitation of the king that I answered to. And the king runs the kingdom. In his kingdom, there's no sickness. In his kingdom, there's no disease. In his kingdom, there's peace and joy. In the kingdom, there's restoration. That's the kingdom he brings to you. Healing is in his kingdom. He wants, to, he wants to deliver you from that foul disease. Three years, huh? Do you have the PET scans? I mean, I know you have the symptoms, but do you have the scans and everything? Several. Just one Several. this week, actually, that showed more progression. You just had a, a, a scan this week that showed more. Wednesday. Did you hear the story of uh, Lorraine Barge? Did you hear that testimony? I did from her son on the way in. My first time I stepped into the church. And then I heard her testimony on stage. Would that be alright with you if the Lord did for Lorraine Barge? Where's Lorraine? Where's Lorraine? If it, would it be okay with you if the, if the Lord did for you what he did for Lorraine Barge? Would that be alright with you? Yes. It's her testimony. Nobody can ever take that away from her. It doesn't matter how much you talk about it or, or how much you make fun of it or mock it. All the videos you post out there, it doesn't matter. This one right here could care less what you have to say. She could care less what your words of mockery have to say about water, the baptism, the North Georgia revival. Her testimony could look at you and say, I don't, I don't care. I was one who was left for dead. And he found me five years ago and healed me delivered me from cancer and that tormenting spirit. It's okay if the Lord does for you what he did for her? Absolutely. <laughs> All right. All right.
Tell everybody your name. Lynn. And who's this beside you? This is my husband. We've been married for three weeks. Wow. What's your name, sir? Malcolm Anderson. God bless you. Where are you two from? Cleveland. You're from Cleveland. White County, Cleveland, Georgia. How did you hear about the revival? Um, he has a friend that's here. Uh, we just seen him a minute ago. Doug Jackson. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Doug, we know Doug. We know Doug. He's, he's back there praying for somebody. I'm sure loving on somebody or singing or worshiping. He's doing something. He's always helping other people, isn't he? Amen. Amen. What brings you in the water? Well, we are both asking for a total healing in our body. We've, we've gone through so much, each one of us individually. Um, I didn't tell you when I was here two weeks ago that I wear hearing aids, so I have hearing problems. I told you about the Moya Moya disease. I told you about the back and the hip. I went to an orthopedic last week, and they said that I can't have surgery until I have the brain. I can't have surgery on my hip or my back until I have the brain surgery. But I'm believing God is just going to totally heal me without having to have surgery. And we're asking for the gift of speaking in tongues because we know that God has something so awesome for us, a ministry that he wants us to start. So we want that gift of speaking in tongues so the devil won't understand what we're, we're talking to him about when we pray. That gift is available for you tonight. Tonight is a powerful, powerful weapon of mass destruction. You're going to receive tonight. How about you, sir? What brings you in? Well, um, I got a lot going on with me, too. I have a, what they call Wagner disease. I've been in and out of the hospital for the last three years. I've been in the hospital more than I've been out. But the Lord just keeps speaking to me. I got you. I got you. I got you. I went in the hospital three years ago, and the doctors gave me up. They had me hooked up to like seven, eight IVs. As the son said, if you make it the next 24 hours, you're a miracle. But I'm y'all, y'all see, I'm, I'm here. So see, I'm a miracle. See, I'm already a miracle. I, I know what my God can do. You know what I'm saying? I don't need nobody to tell me. You know, he's already shown me. But you know, I just want a little more. You know, God's been good to me. I want to be a witness for him. I want to be a true witness for him. You know, that I can go out in the streets and just, just bring people to him. Because I love the Lord. I mean, God has been good to me. You know, I just have a passion my for my God. You know, I'm going to tell this and I'm going to hush. When I was in the hospital, yes, I get full. I can't help myself. God has made me like this. When I was in the hospital, I was telling a brother here a while ago, God took me back to the cross. And when he got me there, he said, son, he said, before I went to the cross, he said, they beat me with that cantonine whip. He said, but that wasn't enough. He said, so they nailed nails in my hands and in my feet. He said, but son, that still wasn't enough. He said, they put the crowns of thorns on my head. He said, the blood came streaming down. He said, but that still wasn't enough. So he said, I asked for something to drink. They gave me vinegar. He said, but you know what I said through it all? Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. He said, son, he said, I'm telling you that for a reason. He said, people, if they done what they done to me and I was who I was, they're going to do everything to you. He said, but you just got to say the words, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. You know, I love my Jesus. I'm telling you, man. She tell you, she called me waterworks. Because I get to talking about the Lord and I get to crying. I don't care. I don't need no sermon. I don't need a song. I don't need nothing. I just know what he done for me on that cross. And it just makes me cry to see how sin sick this world is and how people are, you know. Don't want to serve a God like that. All that he's done for us. You know, by his stripes, he said, we are healed. You know, I love him. I, I love him, man. I love him. But see, I love him because he first loved me. You know what I'm saying? All I want is to do him good. And that's all I need to say, man. I'm, 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 I'm Beautiful. 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 I believe you're going to have the opportunity to say a whole lot more to a whole lot of people. I believe you're going to have a whole lot to say to a whole lot of people. Mm. All my life, 
you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath I'm able, that's you, I will sing of the goodness of God. Just lift your hands, mama, just lift your hands. All my life you have been faithful. All my life. With every breath. With every breath that I am I will sing. Of the goodness. Come on. Somebody at home needs to stand up right where you are and begin to sing. Just lift your hands. All my life. All my life. All my life. The enemy's telling you he's not been there for you. The enemy's telling you God's not been there for you. Or you wouldn't have been through all this. Just lift your hands. All my life. You've been so, so good. With every breath. With every breath that I made. Woo. It's coming, Mama. He's coming for you. He's coming. He's coming. And all my life, you have the been faithful. Hold your nose. He's coming, Mom. He's coming. Healed and whole. I got the brain from the crown all the way down. So good. Every breath that I am able. Now lift your hands. Lift your hands. Lift your hands right there. Say, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Fill me. Fill me. Fill me with the Holy Ghost. And fire. And fire. And fire. With the evidence. With the evidence. I'm speaking in new tongues. I'm speaking in new tongues. I receive right now. I receive. I receive right Jesus now. Name. One more time. This time when you come up, no English, no, no French, no Spanish, no no language. It'll be the Holy Ghost. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Era mama sete. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Say, Jesus. Jesus. I love you. I love you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. That you saved me. And tonight, Lord. And tonight, Lord. I'm asking you. I'm asking to you. Baptize me to baptize me. In the Holy Ghost. In the Holy Ghost. And, Jesus. Fire. and fire. With the evidence. With the evidence speaking in of speaking in new tongues. Tonight I receive. Tonight I receive. The prayer language you give me. The prayer language you give me. Jesus. In Jesus.
Come on in. Came a long way. Tell us your name. My name's Judy Morris. I'm Mary. Mike Chalubnik. And you three are from where? We're from Phoenix, and Mike is from San Diego. San Diego it's my brother. That's your brother. San Diego and Phoenix, Arizona. Wow. What brings you to the waters here in Dawsonville? Well, my son's heart was at 20%. They wanted to do a heart transplant. We gave him a washcloth, he's at 30%, but I just believed if I could get in here in the water for him, that God was gonna give him a new heart. My daughter has never been able to get pregnant. I believe God really wants to give her a baby. And my brother needs an eye healing. We're here for them. That's beautiful. beautiful. Those things seem very difficult. You know, Jesus never came to do difficult things. He came to do impossible. Absolutely impossible things he came to do. And he did them. He healed them all. How about you? What brings you in the water? My husband has been, uh, had severe mobility challenges for seven years. So it's been over seven years since we've been out to dinner or, or been to church because he just can't. He, he, he walks with a walker and has had uh, two prior surgeries and we've seen specialist after specialist and they just always say something different and one contradicts the other you need this kind of surgery you need that kind of surgery he gets very confused I get confused and I'm just I want to see my husband out of chronic pain and I want to see him smile again instead of just always being in bed in pain it's a terrible life it's a terrible thing for him And we prayed and we've had ministers come and pray over him. And I I don't know what we're doing wrong, but we just, it's it's God's perfect timing, but I'm so glad to be here (laughs) to stand in for him. So please. We are so honored that you are here. And it's not anything we're doing wrong. I'm sure. The disciples said, who sinned? What, who, who's, in the, who's in the wrong here, Jesus? Who did this? Is it his own sin? It is, was it his mama? Was it his daddy? Whose fault is it? Is it his? Is it theirs? Whose? And Jesus said, no, 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 listen, you're missing it. It's so my father can be glorified. I want him to be glorified today. Yeah, I want my husband to walk. Get the rid of that walker. Get rid of it and walk and stand and get rid of the garment of pain and get that garment of praise on. I want to see my husband call me tonight with just joy on his face. Don't you? Please help me pray for him. Pray for Dominic, please. 
John. Dominic, can we, we want to invite you to stand right where you are. It's been such a battle. <laughs> there, there are important things in your life, we understand. But not in this moment. In this moment, this is the most important thing. So if you would, just lay your own cares and needs to the side for just a moment. She's begging you. You heard her. She's begging you, please help me. Please pray for my husband, Dominic. You know, all those doctors, they all say different things, but you know who says the same thing every single time? The word that never changes. He said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and I will be tomorrow, and the next day and next week, I will not change. My word is true. Men and women, we try to figure everything out. Jesus said, I figured it out. I gave my life for this, the Lord says. What's your husband's name? Dominic. Dominic. I just wanted to make sure you released it one more time in the atmosphere so the angels, according to Hebrews 1.14, could grab a hold of his name and latitude and longitude. Go find her husband right now on his sick bed. Right there where he's on his bed, in the, on the couch, on the recliner, wherever he is. Quicken his mortal body. The Spirit of the Lord raised Jesus Christ from the dead, according to Romans 8, 11. Quicken his mortal body. Jeremiah 30, 17. Heal his wounds and restore his health. For Dominic. Because all his life you've been chasing after him. For this moment. For this moment. So the Lamb of God could receive the full reward of his suffering. And how about you, sir? I've been on a road trip uh, with Mary and Judy from, uh, well, I live in San Diego, and we left uh, from uh, the Phoenix area. And I have a very severe sleep apnea problem that they made me very aware of. And uh, I think also an inguinal hernia, maybe some circulation issues. I'm noticing some varicosities in my legs. Um, so I think, I think those primary issues. Thank you. No, I've been baptized. Okay. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my so, oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song, cause you got a lion inside of those lines, get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul, oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song, cause you got a you get shy on me lift up your song cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs get up and praise the Lord Whoa. oh come on my soul oh don't you get shy on me lift up your song cause you've got a lion inside of those Get up and praise the Lord. 
fire. Fresh wind, fresh fire. Tell everybody your names. Debbie Bradshaw. Jeff Bradshaw. Where are you two from? Orlando, Florida. Wow. What brings you up to Dawsonville in the water? We want more Holy Spirit, the fire, so we can do uh, more power evangelism, outreach, and um, deliverance. Uh, first of all, I'd like to pray for my marriage that the Lord would heal our tinnitus so we could hear one another better and me personally that I'd listen to her better. And um, also, the Lord opened an incredible door. I was baptized radically at 97 with the Holy Spirit and he's opened up a door for us to do ministry in India. And there's so many people coming to Jesus through the Holy Spirit and healing miracles. And uh, so we're we're part of an effort to build houses of prayer and support a network of missionaries that are over there, over 60 missionaries. And we're just watching God bring the, uh, the untouchables, the out of EC tribe and neighboring countries in Northern India. So it's just exciting. And you're right, brother, there's no retirement. It's called promotion, promotion, promotion. And that's what the Lord's doing. And I want to be ready to receive that promotion and run with it close to my wife. <laughs> so, of course, we need more Holy Spirit to do that.
Tell us your name. My name is John. John. Elizabeth. Anne. Anne, where are you three from? North Carolina. What part? Uh, Fayetteville. Fayetteville. What brings you in the water tonight? Well, we were here week 287, and um, I just came back to give God glory. So I asked you to pray for me. I had lost my boldness. But what I didn't realize is how blind I was. And God removed all the darkness. So not only am I praying for the sick, not only am I bold and able to worship, but he has done so much. So I just wanted to come back and say thank you to God right here. And I also wanted to tell God that I say yes to everything that he wanted to do. And that's it. That's so good. So good. So good. So he gave you the boldness and then healed your eyes too while he was at it. Well, it's, I, you know what? It, it's, he taught me. As a Christian, sometimes we don't even realize how, how much oppression we have and we, we don't know. And until you have real freedom, you don't know that you don't have the more freedom. And I was there and it was only, what, three months ago. And since then, it's, it's been, yeah, stories. That's incredible. That's incredible. Elizabeth, what brings you in the water? Uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay. How old are you? Eleven. Okay, so the last time I was here, um, I was looking for an overhaul. I had listed a whole bunch of things. Uh, in the meantime, from different people praying and everything, my right foot seems to be healed. I think my left knee got healed from intercessory prayer at our church on Wednesday. But the constant battle that everybody's been praying against is the high blood pressure and for my heart. Um, and there's a the heart murmur and then... Uh, they're going to do an echo on December 7th and I would like it to show clear and everything is good and my blood pressure to be normal again. So we agree. Amen. Let it be so. Amen.
Awesome, man. Good to see you back. What's your name? Nick. Nick. Yes, sir. Nick, where are you from? I'm from uh, Georgia. From Blue Ridge, yeah. Blue Ridge. Yep. Awesome, Nick. When were you here last? Um, not long ago. I actually joined here, but I've been traveling a lot and doing ministry. Yeah, so. It's good to see you. And then this is your first time here. What's your name? Lauren. Lauren? Yes, sir. Where are you from? Houston, Texas. Houston, Texas. Houston, Texas. You live there? You moved here? Or? I live there. I live in Houston. Yeah. You live in Houston, but you're here in Dawsonville, Georgia. Yes, sir. What brings you in the water? So um, Nick and I met in August at a conference, um, and we are getting married. So <laughs> You're looking to make sure it's okay you announced that. <laughs> like, should I say that right now? <laughs> Thank you. It's been um, a really long time that I've been waiting for this. So I've been praying. I'm 37. Wow. I've never been married. I've been praying for this for like over, well, 20 years. Wow. And I've been waiting for a long time for the right person. And um, yeah, he came. Yeah. Praise God. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. That's incredible. <laughs> Nick, do you love God with all your heart? Yes, sir. Who is Jesus Christ of Nazareth to you? Everything. He's, a everything. He's everything. 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 He's everything. Everything. You gonna be good to her? Oh yeah. <laughs> I feel like the Lord allowed it to go that long because He didn't want to send you somebody that was good. He wanted to send you somebody godly that would have the heart that He needed, because the Lord had to work on Him a little bit longer right. to get Him ready just for you just for you so I prayed for um, a man with the heart of David and I was like no Lord give me the heart of Jesus <laughs> 
So, um, yeah, he, he did a lot of work on both of us before we met. Well, you know, it's a process. Yeah, sure. So, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> those two years? Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. One and three? Yes. <laughs> One and three? No. I'm not that good. You are professional. Thank the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anything yeah. else? Uh, we're, it's just a dedication. The Lord uh, led me to set the date for the first day of Hanukkah, which is dedication, December 8th. So we're getting married uh, in Houston. Yeah, I'm moving from here. God opened the door, sold my business and everything. So, wow. yeah, so he's faithful. That's dedication. Amen. That's a godly man. <laughs> that smile what is your name Annette. Annette Annette where are you from Fayetteville North Carolina Fayetteville actually Stephen which is a small community outside of Fayetteville okay. there was another group that was here uh, do they come with you no. no I don't know them you don't know them but you came from the same city or vicinity anyway yeah well what brings you in the water I want absolute total undeniable deliverance from rheumatoid arthritis and I want 2020 vision in my left eye that's what I want from the Lord and I want household salvation 
My family is a wreck. Currently. Currently. They are a wreck. Not because they didn't know, but because they made really bad choices. And I know that God is able. And I know that it can happen in a moment. You know, they can just turn around and change. And I've done all I know to do to keep rheumatoid arthritis at a minimal level. But God is able to do it completely. Yes. Changed my diet, quit taking the medicine, and did it all. Praise the Lord. I want deliverance. Amen. He wants you deliver. Yes, he does. First time. What's your name? Larry. Larry. What's your name? Maria. Maria, and you've been here before. When were you here last? I've been here with my two of my kids. Okay. Welcome back. Where are you from? Tulsa, Oklahoma. Tulsa. You flew into Atlanta? No, we drove. Yeah. How many hours was that? Uh, about 12. You drove 12 hours? Good driver, yes. Why would you drive 12 hours from Tulsa, Oklahoma? I mean, there's good churches in Tulsa. There's great churches out there. There's no telling how many churches you had to pass. Why would you come to Dawsonville, Georgia? Uh, we want to be here. Today is our 45th anniversary. Happy anniversary. And we want to renew our vows wow. to God. And I also I want to repent because all this 45 years I was not the godly husband and the godly father I should be. Wow. So for that, I will, will ask God for forgiveness wow. and to forgive me. And I want to be the one which is God meant me to be wow. from now on. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. How about you? Well, that's what we are together. I just, um, I saw Jesse Green on YouTube with um, on Elijah Elijah list and I was praying a lot for for him and when I saw that 
o Jesse Green, I show him and I say, what do you think about it? It's time for you to, you know, let's get together for God, you know, in front of God and, and pray for children because we have some kids that need God too. Um, so we listened together and he agreed. And we came here because Jessie Green said even herself she came with her husband and had baptism in here. I said, why can't you come with me? And let's start all over again nicely. So she's happy what's, what she prayed for has happened today. And also I want to mention, if not too much, for if you can pray for our son Joshua. He has addiction on drugs, drinking and smoking. So God can uh, help him to get off. He wants to, but he can't by himself. And also my daughter Rachel, uh, she's our youngest of the, of the nine children we have. And she's dealing with some sickness physically and uh, mentally. So that's why we are here. We believe God will, will do what we ask for. Amen. And we ask for our help. Amen. And for healing our body too. I have a lot of allergies, food allergies, and could be from depression and stress because I went through this years a lot. A lot of things, so. There's no condemnation here. There's no condemnation. There's conviction, but no condemnation. It sounds like you've answered that call to conviction for the Holy Spirit to cleanse and purge out all those years that you didn't fulfill. And he allows you to make new vows tonight to move forward in your family, household salvation. Nine children, how many grandchildren? 18. 18 grandchildren. May the blessing come upon you tonight and your children to your children's 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 children. Jesus.
tell us your name. Ruth Holloman. Ruth, where are you from? Peachtree Corners, Georgia. Yeah. Okay. What brings you up to Dawsonville in this water? Well, it's time for me to ask for three things. A physical healing, um, for redemption of family relationships, and to affirm that I am under the yoke of my Rabbi Jesus. He is my King and my Lord, and I'll, here's the rest of my life. Here we go. So. In Jesus' mighty name. Holy Spirit told you to come? Yeah. Well, what's your name? Roseanne. Roseanne, where are you from? Florida. What part? Um, near Daytona. It's a little town called Ormond Beach. Ormond Beach. I know exactly, yeah. What brings you back in the water? Well, there's a couple of issues. Um, number one, um, I have high blood pressure, and the doctor wanted to increase it, and I did not do that. I just don't want to be on all this medicine. Sure. But number two, I had a... Um, hip replacement on my right hip. On my right hip, they said I have a lot of um, arthritis there. 
And even though I had that done, I still get pain at times. And um, if I go for a walk, even around the subdivision I live in, it's very, it's painful. And they did an MRI and they said, yeah, there's a lot of arthritis there in my right hip. So I um, believe in God for a miracle for that. And let me think what else, oh my goodness. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, uh, I think like the enemy's trying to block me. Okay, my bowels. I had a, a medical procedure done five years ago. It was the wrong one. It messed me up with the doctor. And um, I'm having problems with my bowels. One doctor, they couldn't do a colonoscopy on me because they couldn't get the instrument to go up. Said like, there's a kink there, whatever that means, a kink. And uh, he wanted me to see a surgeon and get half my left side of my bowels out, my sigmoid, I think, this side. And I didn't do that. Then I went to another doctor and he's do pelvic floor therapy uh, because the muscles are like really, really tight. And anyway, um, I don't want any of that. I believe in God for a miracle. Then I want to be sanctified with the Lord. Um, I come from a long line of, um, on my mother's side of witchcraft and all that. And we, i I have a beautiful home, but I can't enjoy it because I have this coven of witches that have been after me for years. They come in, when I'm in a hotel, I'm fine. But when I go home, they're, I don't know what they're doing, sending demons in, I can't sleep, we're exhausted. My daughter is back of me. She wanted me to come by myself. She's next and they're infiltrating my house and I pray and I fast and I can't get rid of this thing. And they wanted me dead because, because I uncovered their secrets years ago. They were in a church, a coven of witches. And I w went to the pastor with my, my friend, and they knew it, and they marked, marked me for death, and they haven't let up. And I'm, when you can't sleep, your body's so exhausted. Yeah. You can't sleep. I'm talking not sleeping for weeks, months. It's been going on for years, and I've been crying out to God, repenting for my own sins, my ancestors' sins. There's nothing. What else can I do? What else can I do? Yes. Yes. What can you do? But oh, what he can do. Yes. I'm going to break that off here. here last many years ago a couple of years ago what's your name remember Rosanna Rosanna I remember you came 
A couple of years ago, huh? What brings you back in the water? Uh, right now, I'm believing God for a restoration of my family that's been broken for about seven years. Relationship with my daughter, my grandchildren, and also for the Lord to use me. I believe I have a call in my life and that he would place a position in me where he wants me. Yeah. For his glory. Okay. okay, lift your hands. Say, Lord, here I am. Hello, sir. How are you? Bless you. What's your name? Chris. Chris, where are you from? Gainesville, Georgia. Okay. <laughs> right over, right over the bridge. What brings you in the water? Uh, I have real high blood pressure, and I've been taking the medicine for about a year, and I just can't get over it. You know, it just makes me a zombie, really. And uh, so I want to get. Uh, I know it's generational from my family. I can trace it all the way back to this far, you know, and now it's coming to me. <laughs> and I want to get free of that. And uh, I have some breathing problems I've had for years. I don't know what that's about. Yeah. Well, who is Jesus Christ of Nazareth to you? The Lord and Savior. Then we have great news. Amen. The Lord and Savior wants to reveal himself as healer tonight and restore and baptize her in Holy Spirit and fire.
Tell everybody your name. Austin. Austin. How old are you now? 27. 27. When will you be 28? April. April. Where are you from originally? Dawsonville. Born and raised right here? Born and raised right here. Grew up in this church. You grew up in this church. When did you start coming here? Um, my parents went here before I was born. I was born in the old building and then kind of steered away. My whole family did and probably about five years ago when the revival started, I started coming back and then I moved. Probably two years in, I moved and it's about time. That's actually the reason I'm in here. I backslid. I got away from the church. And it does matter where you go to church. It does matter. Because I'm not saying that they're are bad churches out there, but it it matters who's got your best interest in mind. It matters who your elders are. Wow. 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 I could not agree more. Thank you for sharing that. But backslidden no more. Yes. The the addiction to nicotine, I've, I've done all I can do. I've tried to fight it off on my own. I was like, I've already done it. I've already been freed of it. I know I can do it again. Well, I, I didn't do it. And I was standing back there as Bishop Lance Johnson was up there. And he said, you know, you got to let these things go. And um, another thing, because I'm 27 now, I'm married. I have a son. And back there the whole time, I'm like, I can't leave my family properly with these bondage chains hold me down. How am I supposed to teach my son the ways of the Lord when I'm sitting here bound? How am I supposed to lead my wife? In the- Austin, you're helping somebody out there right now. They're watching. They may not be in the room, but you're helping somebody out there that's watching right now. Same addiction, nicotine, married, got kid, got a kid or kids that are saying, I cannot get free of this. I don't know why. I've tried this and tried that and I can't get free. And, and here you are. You're, you're helping them. You're not going to do it on your own. But you also can't lead a family bound when there's freedom in Jesus. That's why he came. Just just don't be like me, so hard-headed to just submit and say, hey, I need your help. I need you, Lord. Austin, I don't know if you know my story. I was bound for from the time I was 10. Until 1994, it was July 17th of 94. I had tried everything to quit. Yeah, I'd go from cigarettes to cigars to snuff to chewing tobacco to pop. It didn't matter. I'd, I tried it. I couldn't quit. And one day, one day, my preacher in a Baptist church, thank God for the Baptist church, his name was Todd Smith. He preached a message called Shattering Strongholds. I said, Lord, it's not a stronghold in my life. I can quit at any time. And Holy Spirit said, yeah, and how's that, how's that worked out for you in the past 14 years? I said, wow, it's a stronghold. Pastor Todd said, you'll know it's a stronghold when there's nothing you can do that'll keep you from going back to it. When it's got a hold of your life so strong, there's nothing you can do to shake it. That's when you know it's a stronghold and it can only come out one way. Jesus has to come bind that strong man. And when Jesus binds that strong man and escorts him out, it's the point of no return. July 17, 1994, the last day after a 14-year addiction, nicotine broken off my life. Only, Only by the blood. Only by the blood. Only by his broken body. Only through salvation that came from one drop of his blood would have been enough for me. And that same blood, it's never lost its power. Come on, come on. It's still here for you. How many years you been bound? I was 15 when I picked up my first cigarette. It's about 12 years. 13. You want to be free? Absolutely free. I was, broke my knee in February and I was sitting there and I was like, well, 
I not receive my healing too well? This is your first time in the water. Who's your daughter? Megan. Megan's your daughter. Wonderful. How old is Megan? Yeah, she's 19. She's 19. What is your name? Christy. Christy. Where are you from? I'm from here in Cumming. Right down the road in Cumming, Georgia. And Megan's been in here before? Yes. What'd she say about the experience she had? Oh, that it changed her and that it was amazing. It changed a 19-year-old? <laughs> and you, you know that has to be the Lord, right? Yes. What brings you in the water? There's a lot of things. Spiritual warfare is definitely one of them. And I want to be slain in the spirit. Um, I uh, suffer from methamphetamine addiction um, for eight years. And God met me at the water September 3rd, 2020. And he took that from me. I mean, took it from me, everything. Yeah. No alcohol, no drugs since 2020, September 3rd. Um, And my life has been renewed and restored and made so good. And... I feel um, I know God now. Um, however, um, I still suffer from a lot of PTSD. And um, I know God is a loving God, but I still don't understand why He would allow me to be hurt as I was in childhood. Yeah. 
many, many, many times. And so I still keep this wall up between him and I. As much as I try to say I don't, tonight was the first night I felt the wall come down. My God. <laughs> My Lord. So I knew tonight was the night to get in. You literally felt the wall come down. Yes. That's him. There's, you know there's nobody else that could do that. Great messages won't do that. They're, they're wonderful. We need those. It's the liberator, Jesus, that comes in and breaks that wall down. There's no wall he wouldn't break down for you. You know that? I know that. I just don't feel it. I know it, but I don't feel it. <laughs> and I want to feel it.
the same vicinity. Light and darkness don't fellowship. Again, good to see you again. That's your mother. She just received her prayer language. Did you hear that? That wasn't English. That wasn't Spanish. That wasn't French. I know a little bit of Spanish. That was not that. That was incredible. It was. You, you've been evidently you've been living and shining your light so mom could see. I. She's been shining her light as me in me just as much. My Lord. Yeah, she helped bring me closer to Jesus for sure. Megan, and who's this with you? I'm Brooke. Brooke, where are you two from? I'm from Cumming. Cumming. Well, what brings you in the water tonight other than celebrating with mom? So in July, I got in the water and I was healed from my depression and my anxiety. Tell us about that. How bad was it when you came in? Which pool were you, did you come into? I was in this one. This one. What happened when you came? And I dealt with suicidal thoughts and just was felt like I had no purpose. and just had horrible depression and I struggled with this toxic soul tie with an ex-boyfriend that I had and just couldn't shake anything. For three years, I tried to get over it and it, nothing helped. And then I got in the water and I have yet to have a depressive episode since. Any suicidal thoughts? When was that? This was in July. Of this year? Yes. And you've not had one episode? No. And normally they come and go every two or three weeks. Not one? No. No suicidal thought. No. No question of my life. So I've been healed. I am in the water tonight just to fully give myself to God. Um, I found myself kind of indulging in back into sin, and I just want to like get rid of that and just completely give myself to God. He healed me in the water that day, but tonight I want to just give myself to Him completely. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. What about you? I go through a lot of depression, just like what she was saying, and I'm trying to get myself to God to let him heal me. I've struggled with depression for probably five years now, so, yeah. How many years did you struggle? Um, since I was in eighth grade. If he did it for her, he'd do it for you. Yes, sir. Who is Jesus Christ of Nazareth to you? He's my savior. Are you okay if tonight he reveals himself as healer? Yes, sir. And deliverer? so that you never have to deal with that foolish stuff again, so that you can have the same testimony in one moment in a small pool of water. I don't know why water. I just know he met with me. And what I had before I got in the water, I don't have anymore. He broke its power off my life. You want that same story?